Let's just pray. Father, we want to continue, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord, and uh, we pray that, Lord, you will continue to speak to us. Father, we pray that you will reveal your word to us. And we pray, Father God, that just, just as we receive your word, your word will change us, your word will transform us. Father, we open our hearts, we open our minds to you, that as we look at your word and as we hear your word, you would speak into the depths of our hearts, Lord. Lord, we don't want to be people who be just hearers of your word, but Lord, we want to be doers. We want your word that will come in, your, in the power of your spirit to change us, Lord, on the inside. Help us, Lord. We come in ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Okay, we want to continue uh, in our journey of uh, going through the book of 2 Samuel. And uh, last week uh, we had another topic that was shared by Stanley on forgiveness. But we'll, you know, pick up uh, our journey on 2 Samuel. And today we're going to look at chapter 15 and chapter 16. Okay, so, so as I was just going through this chapter, the theme that came across to me uh, through these chapters were communication and leadership. Very, very crucial. Uh, so, so that aspect uh, of leadership is extremely crucial. And uh, if you're not very careful, we can land up into disastrous situations. Okay. So before I look at the passage, uh, I would like to read uh, a small story. Uh, many of us may have heard about this, but uh, it will just help us to understand the importance of communication and if it's not done well, how misunderstandings can arise. Okay, so the story goes this way. The story deals with a ra rather old-fashioned lady who was planning a couple of weeks vacation in Florida. Uh, she also was quite delicate and elegant with her language. She wrote a letter to a particular campground and asked for reservations. She wanted to make sure that the campground was fully equipped, but didn't know quite how to ask about the toilet facilities. She just couldn't bring herself to write the word toilet. Okay, So in her letter. So after much deliberation, she finally came up with the old-fashioned term bathroom commode. Okay, so uh, but when she wrote that down, she still thought she was being too forward. So she started all over again, rewrote the entire letter, and referred to the bathroom commode simply as the WC, or as the BC, okay, BC, bathroom commode, so BC. Uh, so so she, she started in her letter, does the campground have its own BC, is what she actually wrote. Well, the campground owner wasn't old-fashioned at all. And then he got the letter, and he couldn't figure out what the lady was talking about. That BC really stumped him. Okay? After worrying about it for several days, he showed the letter to other campers, but they couldn't figure out what the lady meant either. The campground owner finally came to the conclusion that the lady, well, lady was and must be asking about the location of the local Baptist church. <laughs> BC. Okay, so the Baptist church. Okay, so, so he sat down and wrote the following reply. Dear madam, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter, but I now take pleasure of informing in that the BC is located nine miles north of the campsite <laughs> and is capable of seating 250 people at one time. <laughs> I admit it is quite a distance away if you are in the habit of going regularly. Okay? But no doubt you will be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along you know, and make a day out of it. They usually arrive early and stay late. So the last time my wife and I went was six years ago. <laughs> And it was so crowded that we had to stand up the whole time we were there. So, it may interest you to know that right now there is a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. They plan to hold the supper in the middle of the, of the BC. So everyone can watch and talk about this great event. I would like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. But it is surely not for lack of desire on my part. 
as we grow older it seems to be more and more of an effort particularly in cold weather if you decide to come down to the campground perhaps i could go with you and first time sit with you <laughs> and introduce you to all other folks this is really a very friendly community okay oh yeah somebody saying hallelujah okay so <laughs> not very sure of that okay now communication is extremely crucial if it is not done well or if it is not done at all it can be really disastrous and it can have really disastrous consequences also and today we're going to look at the impact of you uh, know non communication or inaction uh, you know on the part of david and david's time what happened in david's time uh, in the land of israel okay so if you have your bibles so if you can turn with me to second samuel chapter 15 and 16 i'll read for us chapter 16 and i'll just share the highlights of chapter chapter 16 so that like uh, you know we'll be able to spend time on looking at uh, what are the aspects that are covered in these two chapters so if you have your bibles or uh, ipads or whatever uh, devices you can open that to second samuel and chapter 15 so i'll read that here we go in the course of time Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He could get up early, he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate whenever anyone came with a complaint to him, complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, "What town are you from?" He would answer, "Your servant is from the tribes of Israel." Then Absalom would say to him, "Look, your claims are valid and proper." but there is no representative of the king to hear you and absalom would add if only i were appointed judge in the land then everyone who has a complaint or case would come to me and i would see that they receive justice also when whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him absalom would reach out to his reach out his hand hold take hold of him and kiss him absalom behaved in this way toward all the israelites who came to the king asking for justice and so he stole the hearts of the people of israel at the end of 4 years absalom said to the king let me go to hebron and fulfill a vow i made to the lord while your servant was living in geshur in aram i made this vow if the lord takes me back to jerusalem i will worship the lord in hebron the king said to him go in peace so he went to hebron then absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of israel to say as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets then say absalom is king in hebron 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied uh, Absalom they had been invited as guests and went quite innocently knowing nothing about the matter while Absalom was offering sacrifices he also sent for ah- Ahitophel the Gilonite the David's counselor to come from Gilo his hometown and so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom following Absalom's following kept on increasing a messenger came and told David the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, "Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ru- bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword." Then the king's officials answered him, "Your servants are ready to do whatever the lo- whatever our lord the king chooses." The king set out with his entire household following him. but he left 10 concubines to take care of the palace so the king set out with all the people following him and they halted at the edge of the city all his men marched past him along with the along with all the kerathites and the pelathites and all the 600 gitites who had accompanied him from gath marched before the king the king said to itai the gitite why should you come along with us go back and stay with king Ab- absalom you are a foreigner and exile from your homeland you came only yesterday and today shall i make you wander about with us when i do not know where i'm going go back and take your people with you may the lord show you kindness and faithfulness but it i replied to the king as surely as the lord lives and as my lord the king lives wherever my lord the king may be whether it, it means life or death there will be there will your servant be david said to itai go ahead march on so itai the gitite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him the whole country wept aloud as all the people passed the king also crossed the kidron valley 
and all the people moved on towards the wilderness. Zadok was there too, and all the Levites were there with him, were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God, and Abathir offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. Then the king said to, this, king said to Zadok, Take the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back, and let me see, see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, then I'm ready. Let him do whatever, do to me whatever seems good to me. The king also said to Zadok the priest, do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. Take your son Ahimaaz with you, and also Abathir's son Jonathan. You and Abathir's, Abathir return with your two sons. I will wait at the forts in the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abathir took the ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went up. Now David had been told Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. When David arrived at the summit where people used to worship God, Hushai the Archite was there to meet him, his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, your majesty, I will be your servant. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I will be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahithophel's advice. Won't the priests Zadok and Abathir be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace. Their two sons, Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, and Jonathan, son of Abathir, son of Zadok, and Jonathan, son of Abathir, are there with them. Send them to me with anything you hear. So Hushai, David's confidant, arrived at Jerusalem as Absalom was entering the city. Chapter 16 has three incidences. One is about Mephibosheth, and uh, Mephibosheth has a servant by the name of Ziba, and uh, Ziba says that Mephibosheth is still in the city, uh, waiting and hoping that uh, all his grandfather's property and kingdom would be restored back to him. So that's what happens there. And so David says, Ziba, whatever like uh, I've given to Mephibosheth will belong to you. And so he says that to Ziba. And then we also see another incident of a man called Shemai, uh, who was from Saul's clan. And he's really upset with uh, David. And he spells out curses on David as he's moving out of the city. And in the end, we see Ahithophel's advice to Absalom. So Absalom asks for Ahithophel's advice as to what should be done. And so Ahithophel says, you sleep with all the concubines of your father. No, and uh, so let this be a disgrace upon this entire land. So those are the three incidences that are covered here uh, in chapter 16. No, it's important for us to know just a little bit of background because what has happened is that uh, Abner, Abner, another son of David, had, uh, uh, not Abner, Amnon, another son of David, had violated and raped Tamar, who was Absalom's sister. Okay? And David had not take any, taken any action on that. And Absalom was furious, and so he plots to murder Amnon, and he kills Amnon. No? And he kills Amnon. So, so that's the situation that is there. And so towards the end of chapter 14, Joab, the commander-in-chief of David, he says, your son like, is, is away from you. You've lost Amnon already, and uh, Absalom is away from you. Why don't you do something to get him back? So let your relationship be restored. So finally, David gets him back. No? And that's where like, we start with uh, chapter 15. So what we see over here, we want to look at some of David's mistakes that he could have avoided as we see as we look at chapter 14 uh, 15 and 16 you know there are some mistakes that David could have avoided so he called his son to initiate reconciliation but he had no dialogue with him at all you know, so so he obeyed his commander in chief brought his son back but he said i don't want to see your face at all. And that's what like we see in chapter 14. When Joab went to Geshur, brought Absalom back to Jerusalem, but the king said, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face 
of his king. So his whole purpose was restoration, but he refused uh, to initiate any dialogue with his own son. So that seems ridiculous. So, uh, so even when Joab, the commander-in-chief, suggested to him that uh, he be brought back, half-heartedly he brought him back, but after that, no action taken. He has taken no action. So it seems like a good gesture towards restoration, but that good gesture was not enough. He just brought him back. You know, I was thinking that suppose the husband, you know, comes late for the third time for their anniversary. You know, comes late for the third time for their anniversary. And he's at the door meeting the wife and says, darling, I bought you a cake from Taj. You know, so what do you expect? I think like maybe the wife will take the cake and smash it on his face and say, wah Taj. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. So good gesture. But this is the third time. You know? I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, it, it, so the action seems good. But there has to be more to it. There has to be a dialogue. There has to be a reconciliation. There has to be some kind of initiative that is there. So David, he was a warrior. He was a great king, a man after God's own heart, a man who confronted his enemies, won victories for the Lord. You know, so he took great initiat initiatives in all the exploits, but when it came to his own family, he did not take that initiative to, to have that dialogue. He faced, he failed to face his own son. And so he ended up as an avoider at that point of time with his own family. So we see the, the effect of sin you know, so, and the impact of sin. What it brings is separation, it brings fear, it, it brings lack of openness and harm between two people, father and son. And, and the enemy would always want us to remain in that state you know, so that we will not be able to experience true community, true forgiveness, and true reconciliation. And so he did not do that. David may have thought time would heal because, uh, because Absalom was in Israel for two years. Two years. But he did not see the face of Absalom at all. He may have thought that time would heal the relationship. In fact, it made it even more worse. It made it even more worse. Was. So, so he was not willing to face the situation. He was not willing to face his own son. So, so many times, like the avoidance does not help, but an initiative on our part to share the truth, to have a dialogue, brings in reconciliation, brings in peace, and brings in restoration. I remember uh, one uh, situation uh, in my college days. So we used to have like a, a huge drawing papers to be submitted in a sense like to draw sketches uh, and then like uh, uh, to submit that uh, to our professor. So each of these drawings, they were like kind of like big sheets, full imperial sheets. Uh, every sheet would take more than a week, uh, you know, to finish those sheets and, uh, sheets and then you go for the submission. So every time you go for the submission, they will remind you of some corrections and so so you would end up going three or four times and uh, finally they will say complete and you'll get your signature and you'll rejoice you know? but i had some of my friends so what they would do is they would wait for the entire process to get over that means that i would finish my c sheet i would finish my correction and i would get the complete remark and then they would come to our place in the evening and then take my sheet and they will glass trace it. Like, you know, they will glass trace it. And then the next few days, they would go and submit it to the professor. You know. Now, the professor was also well aware, like, you know, that these are glass traced <laughs> you know, sheets or drawings. So, so he would look up to them and say, who is your godfather? So they would say, Joseph. Oh, Joseph. Okay. Sorry. So, so... So, so we would go through this like you know many times right? and we had one very close friend of ours so by the time like we were in our fourth year and all of us were really stressed and so we also needed help to finish this uh, sheets like we needed help from 
uh, you know, we needed help from many people to finish those seeds. But this friend of mine who was there would wait for me to finish, you know, and then he would take that. And so, so with one of my friends, we said, this is not good. You know? So uh, we are happy to help, but this is not going to help him in the long run. You know? So, but very difficult, very close. We've been together for four years, like very close to, uh, you know, to share this truth you know, and how to tell him that we won't help. You know? So uh, we want to help, but we can't do this. So one day we gathered courage, and so I went to him and said, uh, you know, we want to help you, uh, but I think, like, you know, you should do something on your own also, you know, rather than just waiting. Uh, so you should help. You should do things on your own. This will help you in the long run. He was really upset. You know, now all these years, you know, what are friends for? You know, you're supposed to help together. I will help you in something else. Like, you know, so... Uh, so why are you taking offense? Like, you know, and so for that little period of time, like uh, uh, that relationship had had we experienced difficulty in the relationship. But you know, after a few weeks, we saw that he started drawing his own sheets, and he started submitting that, and he started you know going ahead with all his other submissions. You know, and he really did well in those submissions. You know. And then, so when I look back, when we finished our studies, when I finished our degree, we came to know that we got, we finished our degree and then we stopped and went to work. He has gone to his post-graduation also. So, I mean, so at that point of time, there was a little bit of difficulty that was there. But, and as we just gathered courage to share, like, I think it's good. It helped him. And it helped him in the long run. And I think like he went ahead of us and we were really happy he took that stand. So sometimes that dialogue is helpful, you know, or uh, sharing the truth, uh, uh, keeping that relationship intact is helpful in the initially we may go through some difficulty, but in the long run, it is really helpful. David did not do that. He, he wanted to initiate reconciliation, but did not have any dialogue with his son. Secondly, David's in intention. I don't know you know whether from his actions it doesn't seem restoration. It seems punishment. Why? Because Absalom said to Job, so Absalom is telling Job, look, I sent word to you and said, come here so I can send you to the king and ask, why have I come to Geshur? It would have been better for me if I were still there, you know, away from the king. Now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I'm guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So, you know, it is almost like Absalom saying, this silence and this isolation is killing me. It is better for me to die, you know, rather than remain in isolation and not knowing what the future holds for me. You know, this is a more severe punishment for me rather than like, you know, you, you, you take stock of my life convict me for something and charge me for something. I'm happy with that. But this isolation is really killing. So, so I don't know. Like, well, so David's aim was restoration, but actually he was punishing, you know, his own son because uh, of his, of the separation that is involved at that point of time. Now we'll agree that if a child is, if a child is very relational, you know, and if the child misbehaves, uh, then the best punishment uh, for the child who's really relationless, so you send the child to their room or whatever, some space, and say, 15 minutes, uh, you be there in that place and then think about your actions. You know, so, so for them, that 15 minutes is more painful. They say, no, 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 you whack me. You know, so you whack me, spank me. I'm okay with that. Like, uh, but don't separate me. You know, so that is more painful you know, than the spanking. And so sometimes, so, so that's the case that is happening over here. Two years, like he was away, uh, Absalom was away from his father. So I believe like it was still that anger, bitterness of all his actions that were fresh in David's life. Twice he had to be reminded by Joab, Joab, bring your son back. And again Joab came and said like, do something for your son. You know, so twice he had to be reminded, but uh, he did not take any action. So finally when he did take some action, it almost seemed like to show off. Like, you know, so, because it, so Joab went to the king and told him this. The king summoned Abs Absalom and he came in and bowed down with his face, uh, face to the ground before the king. And the king, 
kiss Absalom. Seems very great. Yeah, no? So it looks very great. So kiss. But this is just, you know, trying to reconcile and restore all things on the outside. But nothing deeper has happened over here. Sometimes I was, uh, I think that uh, you know, sometimes we send, if a, if a child is small, six or seven, and uh, we punish the child by sending the child to the room or to some place or maybe to a room and say, 15 minutes sit there and I will come there and explain why you're going through this particular punishment. But after 15 minutes, we have forgotten. And after two, two hours, we realize, oh, I, I mean, like, I have not gone back. And by the time we, we rush back to the room, the child has cried and slept. Okay? So, that's a, that's a, so, so that's kind of like David's situation over here, calling him and just forgetting about the situation, uh, about this current crisis that he is going through. David intentionally avoided his son. Dave, third one, David avoided taking initiative in this relational crisis. Avoided taking initiative in this relational crisis. It says in due course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from the, one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. So Absalom uh, did this for four years. Two years, he did not respond. He did not have a dialogue. You know? And then when Joab said, I do want to have a dialogue, you know, I want to meet the king. So he met and David kisses Absalom. After that also, four years, you know, Absalom was at the city gates and he stole the hearts of the people. And so, so David refused to take initiative you know, in this crisis. Uh, he, he, he was not able to look at the repercussions of you know, his inaction. Right? If he didn't do that, what would happen to his country? You know, what would happen to his nation? Probably he thought, was, he thought that Absalom did something wrong, so he should take initiative to come and ask me for forgiveness. Why should I take the initiative? Probably he thought that I am the king. You know, he should come to me. But in this case, he's the father also. You know, father's son. He could have taken initiative. The other thing is, he had Zadok, who was a priest. He had Hushai, who was his confidant. He could have you know, called for third party people to bring in reconciliation. You know, if you're not able to face, but take help. Didn't take help. Didn't take help at all. Avoided taking initiative in this relational crisis. So it is really sad. There is absolutely no communication, no dialogue uh, on the part of David you know, with his son Absalom. And so the consequences of David's silence, his son conspired against him. Such a serious thing. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. So silence and isolation on the father's part led to feelings of revenge, led to feelings of murder. And so the son decides to overthrow the father and take over the kingdom. So the son conspires against him. Then David had to flee from the palace. David had to flee from the palace. Then David said to all his officials, who were there with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Ab Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring us, bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. Finally, you know, discernment came upon him. So discernment at this point of time that I should flee. If he had resisted, there would have been a bloodbath and probably both of them would have got killed. Discernment dawns upon him and he he decides to flee that particular place so that there is no bloodshed. You know? So, but his discernment has come in very late. His discernment has come in very late. So he had to flee 
the palace he puts the entire nation the entire nation went into distress entire nation goes into but david continued up the mount of olives weeping as he went his head was covered and he was barefoot all the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up it was painful it was ridiculously painful a uh, a king's son has put a secure and a peaceful nation into distress and you you can understand when an enemy attacks but when a son you know when your own blood conspires to take over it is not only shocking but it is shameful also so entire nation went into distress david had to bear the fury of the people and so you see over here shimai and so he spelled out curses on david shimai was from the clan of Saul's family from Saul's clan and so he was so it it triggered bitter responses from people and so so he had to endure that and so she might say as the king approached bahurim a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there his name was she my son of gera and he cursed as he came out and he pelted david with all the king and all the king's officials with stones to all the troops Though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right and left, as he cursed, Shimei said, "Get out! Get out! You murderer! You scoundrel! The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a murderer." The only good thing that David did over here is he humbled himself. He did not react. he humbled himself and said maybe this is the lord's doing let me not react you know let me just respond in humility and so he humbled himself before god and before man so that is a good thing that happened but he had to face the fury of his people and finally absalom defied the moral standards of god he defied the moral standards of god because the ahitopel's advice to absalom was that sleep with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace and then all israel will hear that you've made yourself obnoxious to your father and the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute so they pitched a tent for absalom on the roof and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all israel now in those days the advice of ahitopel uh, the advice that ahitopel gave was like that of one who inquires of god that is how they both david and absalom regarded all of ahitophel's advice so the nation because of his silence inaction avoidance went into the hands of a man who was a conspirator murderer and an immoral person royal women had to be protected royal women had to be given dignity but this was something disgraceful that happened in the land of israel ahitophel clearly was a very crafty person so to david he would give a certain advice and to absalom he would give a certain advice and this advice of uh, you know sleeping with his father's concubine and his intention was that any possibility of a reconciliation between father and son would be made impossible with this detestable thing it would be impossible to just imagine any kind of reconciliation that was the advice that ahitophel gave to absalom and so it made matters worse so as we look at david's story we can see ourselves in david many times so we need to search our hearts and and see you know what are the various ways that we would respond in a relational crisis we will try and avoid the issue many times we pretend as if it does not exist we do the bare minimum and expect the other person to respond you know our, our pride and ego plays a huge role in avoiding the situation no he should take the first step she should take the first step i am in this place we hesitate to take initiative in the reconciliation process we hesitate to take initiative and we fail to consider 
the consequences of our inaction. And sometimes it can be extremely serious. We are not able to foresee the consequences of our inaction. And so that is our nature. Our nature is like David. Many times we are like David. We like avoidance. We like silence. We fail to take initiative. We fail to bring the conflict up and try and resolve it. I'll read a story that resembles our nature. You know, it says that a childhood accident caused poet Elizabeth Barrett to lead a life of semi-invalidism before she married Robert Browning in 1846. In her youth, Elizabeth had been watched over by her tyrannical father. When she and Robert were married, their wedding was held in secret because of her father's disapproval. After the wedding, the Brownings sailed for Italy, where they lived for the rest of their lives. But even though her parents had disowned her, Elizabeth never gave up on her relationship. Almost every week, she wrote them letters. Not once did they reply. After 10 years, she received a large box in the mail. Elizabeth found all her letters. Not one had been opened. Today, those letters are among the most beautiful in classical English literature. Had her parents only read a few of them, their relationship with Elizabeth might have been restored. So, so that's our nature. So, so that's the way, like many times, like we would respond to situations. But God's nature is completely different contrary to man's nature. Our God is a God who does not give up on us. And so we see his nature throughout history, always wanting to have a dialogue with us, always reaching out to us, always wanting a reconciliation to be done with us, even when we were wrong. And through the ages, he reaches out to us. That's his, his nature. When man went, went away from God, God did not give up. His word kept bringing us back to him. So, so, so he preserved the word so that the people of God would know the law of God, would know the voice of God, would know the heart of God, and keep. they would have the opportunity to keep connecting to God if they wanted to, if they made a choice. So his word was made available. He made his prophets available to, to ourselves, to us as his people. They kept bringing back people to him. So... So the prophets spoke God's voice you know, so that they would draw the hearts of people back to God. He never let us go. He never left us. He did not avoid us even when we were wrong. And then finally he sent his son to bring us back to him. And so when all this did not work, his son came down to bring us back to him in life and flesh. And now his spirit works in, in the world to bring us back to him. So even after the son, the Holy Spirit is with us, trying to restore us back to our father. So God's nature is completely different, completely the opposite. Constantly reaching out to us, constantly desiring a dialogue with us. So he has always left the door open for us to come back to him to get restored to him, to get reconciled to him. And so just as we've been worshipping God, so this restoration is not only for us, but this restoration is also so that that we would become ambassadors of restoration, ambassadors of reconciliation in this world of ours. So we, we see God's nature completely different, even now reaching out to us and touching us. So that's God's nature for us. And today, He is able to redeem us so that we would be able to have that nature of His. Not avoidance, not silence, not inaction, but being proactive, you know, putting ourselves in a difficult situation, you know, willing to take that risk, knowing that God's Spirit is working in us. This is God's nature 
and God's power is available with us to bring about a restoration in our lives. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 to 21. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we learn this lesson through the life of David or this particular aspect of David's life. Though a man after God's own heart, but in some places, you know, going away from God's plan and purposes. And so for us to look into our hearts and search our hearts, how, how we resemble his heart and his nature, and to know that Christ is able to redeem us so that his nature is part of us and we we get reconciled to people and we become ambassadors of reconciliation in this world that God has called us to live. Presence, Lord, this morning. And truly, Lord, we say many times we are like David, seeking revenge, being half-hearted in our desire for restoration. We avoid situations, we avoid people. We avoid taking initiative in conflicts. And we pray, Father God, this morning, would you give us grace as we look to the cross? Your cross stands as an example of reconciliation. Your cross stands as an example of taking initiative, reaching out to us. Even when we did wrong, and we did not respond to you at all. But Lord, you always kept the door open for us. And you did everything, Father God, so that we would not have any excuse at all, Lord Jesus. You kept the door open for us through your son, Jesus Christ, so that we would be reconciled to you, Lord Jesus. And Father, this morning, Lord, we want to look at our lives and we pray that you would give us grace to respond like Jesus. We remember our situations, even in our own families, Lord Jesus. There may be small issues that upset us, that irritate us. And sometimes there is a long silence. We pray, Father, this morning, give us grace. Give us grace to take initiative, Lord Jesus. Give us grace, Lord, to reach out to our family members, Lord. Give us grace to pick up that phone. Give us grace to go to their homes, Lord Jesus, and talk about those issues, Lord Jesus. And Lord, bring about reconciliation. Bring about restoration, Lord Jesus. Because we know, Father God, that that small silence, Lord, on our part can bring a huge barrier, Lord Jesus, for generations to come can bring a huge division, Lord, for generations to come, Father God. And that would be the result of our avoidance or our inaction. We pray, give us grace, Lord. Father, we pray for our organizations, Lord, for people in our organizations, Lord, with whom we have difficulty, Lord. We pray, help us, Lord, to reach out, Lord Jesus. In difficult situations, help us to take initiative, Lord Jesus. Lord, in loving ways, help us to reach out to them, Lord Jesus. And we believe you will do a miracle. We believe we will see your power. We believe we will see your healing, Lord Jesus. And Lord, not only the individuals will be benefited, not only we will see peace in the relationship, but we will see the organization being blessed, Lord. Because they will see ambassadors 
of reconciliation, working in the organization. Father, we pray, Lord, for our churches also, Lord Jesus. We pray, help us, Lord, with people with whom we have differences or conflicts, Lord. Help us, Lord. Father, sometimes we say we are a community. Sometimes we say we are relational. Sometimes we say that we are a family, Lord. But Lord, with different people, we are not able to get along. We pray, Father, give us grace to take initiative. Give us grace to step in, Lord, to take the risk, Lord, to talk issues, to show unconditional love, Lord Jesus, without any response or without anything in return, Lord Jesus, for us. We truly want this place, want your church to be a community, Lord Jesus, a community where there is true love, Lord, where there is selfless love, Lord, between us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord, to be doers, Lord Jesus. We pray this morning, we, we need the empowering, the Holy Spirit in us, Lord Jesus, to do this. Lord, it's not in our nature, Lord, but your grace is available for us. And so we pray, touch us, change us. And we believe, Lord Jesus, you will do a miracle in our lives. Truly, you will help us to be ambassadors of peace ambassadors of reconciliation thank you father in jesus name